trying to figure out what our schedule is working with. So my office hours here at the church, maybe um, a little in and out as we figure out what, how um, our son's schedule is and how that affects my work schedule here at the church. But as always, I'm working from home at the church computer there, um, so I can always be contacted at home whether or not I am in the office. Uh, Emma's last day working as our church administrator is this coming Thursday, August 13th. Emma is leaving next weekend to go back to university. And so please, if you are able, uh, send her a text, an email, or even mail her a card wishing her well as she embarks on her third year of college. We so appreciate all the work she has done for us since June with keeping the office running, uh, increasing our uh, presence on social media, and making sure that everyone remains connected with one another. Um, on this note, the personnel committee and myself uh, earlier, a couple days ago, we hired a new administrative assistant for the office. His name is Carter, and he will uh, be starting with us this Tuesday, August 11th, so that Emma has a couple days to train him before uh, she leaves for college. Carter is a college student at Central Piedmont Community College, and he plans to transfer to UNCC in the next year or so. He brings with him a wealth of computer-based knowledge and skills that we need during this time to maintain and increase our social media presence so we can remain connected one with another and with, um, welcome people from the outside into our community virtually. Uh, Carter and I will talk this week about what hours he will work in the office around this semester's school schedule for him. My in-office hours are increasing, so I am in the office at least a few days a week. I will continue to do so, um, especially for the next couple of weeks as Carver gets settled into his new position here. However, I also want to uh, remain mindful that um, Carver and I need to remain physically distant um, and therefore possibly working at different times in the office to uh, minimize the um, the, the possibilities of potentially infecting one another with COVID-19 if either one of us ever gets exposed knowingly or unknowingly. The Discipleship Sunday School class is meeting via Zoom on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. I will send out the uh, Zoom link on um, Saturday nights or early Sunday morning for you to be able to get in onto the Discipleship class. Uh, the Seekers class meets via FaceTime, so if you would like to join the Seekers class, uh, please contact Alicia or myself and I can get in touch with Alicia and she can uh, get you connected with the Seekers class. They also meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Our weekly pastors check-in will be taking a little bit of a hiatus starting this week through Labor Day. Um, this Wednesday, August 12th, uh, we'll begin a book series uh, that Kevin and Renee will be leading. The book is entitled the Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. And so um, they will begin, be beginning that on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock via Zoom. A link will be sent out to the congregation for that. It's the same link as the Discipleship Sunday School class. So if you already have that, please use that for the book club on August 12th. Again, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, we have schools starting uh, virtually for our son. Uh, this will give me an opportunity to kind of figure out what my schedule is and the best time for everybody that we can get together on uh, Zoom to have our pastors check in that does not interfere with the book club and also meets with everyone's schedule. When we meet in person to worship, there's a time in our service where we also always worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Because we are unable to meet in person at this time, uh, we are unable to worship God in that way actively together. However, the church still has financial obligations that it needs to meet. So please, in your own way, in your own, uh, please worship the Lord through sending in your tithes and offerings to the church. Uh, you can mail the checks to the church. Carol picks them up about once a week and deposits them. If you are uh, a visitor to our church and you worshiping in the community virtually, um, and you don't necessarily know where physically our address is in Charlotte, you can also go on Givelify and find South Park Christian Church, Charlotte, North Carolina, and you can give over to Givelify uh, to our church as well. We now um, begin our worship through the call to worship, 
which this morning comes from Psalm 85, verses 8 to 13. Hear now these words. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For God will speak peace to his people, to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that God's glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before God and will make the path for God's steps. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We now enter our time in our service where we go before God, offering up our prayers of thanksgiving as well as our prayers of celebration and, and petition. I now invite you to join me in prayer. Merciful and loving God, we come before you thankful that we are able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And while we are separated physically one from another, we are thankful that we can worship you still together. For whether we are watching this, this worship service from the comfort of our living rooms at separate times, we are one in spirit. We are united by your love. And so it doesn't matter if we're watching this on a Sunday morning or a Thursday evening. We are grateful that we can be together as a community, knowing that we are hearing the same words, worshiping you, and partaking in the Holy Meal of Communion together as a community. We are thankful, God, that even in this time of challenges, that even in this time of struggle for so many, we are reminded every day in big and small ways that your presence remains with us that you are always here to hold us, that you are always here to guide us, to guide our footsteps, that in times of challenges and struggle, you remain with us to hold us, to support us. When we need comforting, we can turn to you. When we have things to celebrate, we know that they are gifts from you, and we thank you for them. God, we thank you for this community that is called South Park Christian Church, for the faithful members of this church, for the love that endures in this community, even in this time of physical distancing. God, many times we take our communities for granted, our communities of faith for granted, knowing that we will see one another on Sunday mornings, at the very least, when we are able to come to church. But in this time, when we are separated because of this pandemic, it speaks loudly for the commitment and the love that this congregation has for you and the faith that we place in you and the community that we have built to support one another. Because through social media and technology and phone calls, we are able to remain connected one with another. We are able to see one another on the screen we are able to hear each other's voices, and we have remained committed to you and to the call that you have placed on our lives and in this community to be a presence in the world today. God, we trust in you that your, your desire for this church is to continue, that we are to continue being a presence of hope and life in our community here in Charlotte, and indeed, across the world from where people may be watching us from other countries. God, we ask that you would help us to keep our focus on you, our vision on your will, and our desire to serve you as paramount in our calling. We pray, God, that you would help stem egos and a desire for self-acknowledgement and allow us the wisdom and the humility to serve you and to know that it is because of you we are a community and it is because of you 
that we are in this community, in this time, and in this place. God, we bless your name. We lift it up to you. And in so doing, we lift up to you our prayers that are on our hearts. We now have a moment of silence where we lift up to you our personal prayers of petition and our personal prayers of thanksgiving. Indeed, God, because of your love for us, we call you blessed. We call you blessed one, O Lord our God. And in that, blessed are you, loving God. For you are our wellspring and omega point. Your spirit binds us together in respect, dignity, and service. Gather our community together wherever each of us may be, now and in the future. Blessed are you, creator of all that is. In your image we are made. In your likeness, you fashion and form us. Your breath gives us life that we may know you, O creator. Day by day you pour out your love to us that we might see the beauty of all you have done. Blessed are you, steadfast lover. You are ever faithful. Your promises endure throughout all generations. Though we wander far from you, your ardent desire to be our God ever calls us back. With a love overflowing, you draw us to yourself. Blessed are you, gracious giver of salvation. Your great power wells up within us to be our strength, to be our hope, to be our glory. With your mighty arms, you shelter us in times of distress. You go before us that with your grace we may win victory over death. Blessed are you, source of all compassion. You tremble as a mother giving birth. For when we, your people, suffer in darkness, you bring forth light and life. The warmth of your love for us melts away fear and sadness. You bring to new birth the dawning child of mercy. Gather us now into one holy union. Give us the grace to look beyond all divisions. Show us the oneness that we are called to be. Guide us to the source of all community. Infuse our hearts with one desire and bring us to the fullness of your one love. In communion with our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and with the Holy Spirit, who remains our guide, we, your gathered people, both near and far, in one voice, give you all praise, all honor, all glory. For by your gracious love, we are holy people for all generations, world without end. Amen. This morning's scripture comes to us from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 1 to 21. Hear now these words. Beloved, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may all be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God, and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near, is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. 
The scripture says, no one who believes in God will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on the Lord. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim this one? And how are they to proclaim this one unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, Isaiah says, all day long, I, God, have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this chapter of Romans 10 can be quite difficult to preach on as a single entity. For to do this correctly, we need to keep in mind that Romans 9, 10, and 11 is intended to be studied and read and thought of as one entity. Now remember, back when the, our scriptures were written, back when these words were written down, when Paul wrote these words, there was no chapter and verse delineation. For those uh, separations came later on. So when Paul wrote this, there was no Romans 9, 10, or 11. It was just a part of the letter to the Romans, and this was uh, 9, 10, and 11, as we know today, was to be taken in one source, one entity. So we have to understand what the topic is that Paul is trying to write about. So at the end of, or in Romans 9, and 10, and 11, the Israelites, the people of Israel, are trying, or the Jewish people, I should say, are struggling with their faith. And Paul is struggling as to why there are not more Jewish people uh, dedicating their lives to Christ and following the way as it was known during this time. The way was um, how the people who followed Christ were referred to. What was the struggle? What was preventing the Jews from really following the message of Christ? Why was Paul having a hard time convincing the Jews to be able to follow the way of Christ? Now, Paul was not having too much of a hard time attracting the Gentiles, which were the non-Jews. That part of the way was growing quite rapidly. But the Jewish people were hesitant to come aboard. And, and the more the Gentiles came, the fewer the Jews that wanted to come. So Paul is trying to figure out why is that and what is going on. Well, as we can all imagine, even, you know, we're 2,000 years now into what has become Christianity. And for those of us who were raised in Christianity, we've been raised to see the scripture and the Bible in certain ways. We've been raised to understand Holy Scripture in certain ways. And so when we hear um, somebody try to reinterpret scripture in a way that we've never heard before, we struggle with it, right? We, we struggle with new ideas because they're contrary to maybe how we were raised. Not much different with the Jewish people. They had centuries, millennia, of, of Jewish teaching. And Christ comes, and Christ did not cancel out the teachings of Jewish people. Christ, Jesus was Jewish. He was Jewish through and through. But he challenged some of the 
long-held beliefs. He challenged some of the theology. And then as, as uh, Jesus died and then rose and ascended into heaven, and the disciples took the faith, and now Paul comes in, and he's taking the faith. And Paul was a very devout Jew, as you know, named Saul until his conversion, but he became known as Paul. Uh, Paul was a very devout Jew, and he found life and he found meaning in the Jewish faith. And when he decided to follow Christ, he did not give up his Jewish identity in any way. He incorporated his Jewish identity into his new beliefs. And so he's having a hard time trying to figure out why other Jewish people can't do the same thing that he did. Paul was a very opinionated person uh, throughout the history of his life and what we know of him. You know, what Paul said, you know, if Paul thought it, then he expected everybody else to believe it. And so he accepted this and he was struggling to figure out why the Jewish people were not coming along the way he did. But one of the things that the Jewish people were struggling with is this idea that more and more Gentiles were coming into the faith. And they were struggling because they truly believed that the promises that God had uh, given to them through Moses and Abraham and the prophets before uh, this time were for them. That they were the chosen people. That the Jewish people, the ancient Israelites, and the Jewish people at that time were the chosen ones. And that God's faithfulness was directed for them. So they were struggling with the idea that Paul and the other disciples were inviting and welcoming outsiders into their faith. Well, 2,000 years on now, in Christianity, we struggle with the same thing. We struggle with allowing outsiders in. As open and welcoming as we try to be in our congregations, we still have an opinion and a thought that we've got the truth. And anybody who does not believe exactly like we do is somehow wrong. And maybe people outside of our faith are not children of God and therefore are not welcome to be a part of our communities. But this scripture in here is teaching that God is the God of all people. So Romans 10 isn't about what we as humans do to earn our salvation. It isn't about what we as humans think about who's invited in and who's excluded from being invited in. Romans chapter 10 reveals the character of God, the very essence of who God is, the essence and, and character of God that is love and inclusive, and that God uh, invites all of humanity into a relationship with God. That God's idea of the world and of faith is not about rituals and actions, but it's about the heart and it's about the spirit. And so therefore, whoever believes in God and confesses with their mouth is a child of God. Whether they are Jew or Greek, they are a child of God. In that time and in that place of Paul, it was Jew and Greek. It was, that was kind of the world that they thought of. But today, with such an international, worldwide, global uh, mindset that most of us have, that, that part can say, can say Jew, Greek, American, European, African, uh, Australian. It doesn't matter. All people are invited to God. For, for we are children of the living God. I don't know if you remember when you were a kid. I remember being in grade school. And for PE, we would play kickball or, or softball or something. And the teacher would pick two team captains. And they would come out. And those two team captains would then pick the people from the rest of the class that they wanted on their team. And you would stand there and you'd wait to be picked. And many people were, uh, you know, the team captains would pick their favorite people, and, and many people were picked to be on the teams eagerly. But there were some who were always either not picked or picked very reluctantly. And, and those who were picked reluctantly always felt as if they were not good enough, that they were not popular, that they were not liked. 
That's not how it is in the kingdom of heaven. That's not how it is in what our faith of Christianity is supposed to be. There are no two team captains. There is God. And God invites all of us. There is no eagerly accepting of one and reluctantly accepting of another. There is no favoritism in the eyes of God. There is no buddy who is higher or lower than anybody else in the kingdom of God. For in this scripture we see that we are all one. And that God's love is here on earth today. Many times in Christian theology, we talk about after our death. Can't wait until we are reunited with the Lord. We can't wait until we are in heaven where everything is perfect. There's no more struggles. There's no more strife on earth. And we can be in the presence of Jesus. But no, in this scripture, it says God came to earth in the person of Jesus so that we are reminded that God is with us in the here and now. We do not need to wait until we die and ascend into heaven to be reunited in the presence of God, for we are in the presence of God on this earth today. Even in, during these times when we are sitting at home, when we hear the news and it's some, many times often negative, we wonder where God's presence is. And we can look to Romans 10 and be assured that God's presence is here for us. And it doesn't matter who we are, it doesn't matter where we come from, it doesn't matter what language we speak or our understanding of God, God's presence is here for each of us. And so my friends, this is the definition of Christianity. Christianity is a faith that was never meant to be exclusive and only for a select few. But our faith calls us to be fully inclusive, accepting of all, seeing each person as the image of God created on this earth today. May we live our faith with openness and integrity. May we follow the example of Christ and see God on earth today. May we rediscover and recognize God's love in nature and in the world and those around us. May we today recommit to living our faith in an inclusive manner, welcoming all into our faith. And as we say the disciples of Christ, welcoming all to the table as God has welcomed us. Amen. <laughs>
Each week as we prepare to gather around the table to partake of this holy meal, we start out with a time of confession. Because scripture tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But scripture also tells us that if we confess our sins to God, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins. I now invite you to a time of silent confession as you hear our bells playing a tune at the top of the hour. Let us pray. God, we confess to you that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by the things we have said and done and by the things we have left unsaid and undone. Forgive us, God, and create in us a clean heart and renew our spirits that we may become instruments of your peace, of your love, and of your justice. Our sins we confess to you and with a humble heart, we ask that you would forgive us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. And now hear these words of assurance. There is nothing, nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Neither life nor death, nor powers nor authorities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor anything else separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, for we are a forgiven people. Amen. In the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and here at South Park Christian Church, we practice an open communion, which means all are welcome to partake, whether you believe a little or a lot, whether you've been baptized or not, for this is Christ's table, and you are welcome here. And every week in our church, we remember that it was on the night that he was betrayed that after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which has been broken for you. Likewise, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, for this is the cup of the new covenant, which has been poured out for you and for all people. For as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the mystery of our faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we ask that you pour out your spirit upon the bread and the cup, upon the emblems that each person is holding with them at their own home, and as they prepare to partake of this holy meal, we ask that your presence be alive and renewed within each of us. Guide us, God, create in us a clean heart, so that as we go on in our daily journey, we do so knowing that you've taken our hand and you guide us in your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you to take the piece of bread that you have and partake of the bread of life given for you. Take the cup the cup of new co the new covenant, the cup of hope, and take and drink. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught, praying together. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
passing of the peace is a sacred act of worship. In today's world, we are learning that we don't need to be physically present with each other, with each other, to share the peace of Christ one with another. Please share Christ's peace via text, email, phone calls, mailing handwritten notes, in addition to greeting one another in person. Ecclesiastes 3 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. We are in a season when it is time to refrain from embracing. Please be creative in ways to greet one, one another that does not include physical contact so we can help keep everyone healthy and safe. And now receive this blessing. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands or feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks compassion into the world. Yours are the feet with which Christ walks to do good. And yours are the hands through which Christ blesses the world. So go now in peace and love to serve the world in the name of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. Our worship is ended, that our service begin, and may the peace of Christ be with you now and always. Amen.